May the 6th, 1937. The Hindenburg exploded in flames. It is the most iconic air crash in history. And its cause remains unknown. Can you hold it back, Matt? I'd, I'd take it another 30 degrees. Now, a team of scientists is doing what has never been attempted before. They will build replicas of the Hindenburg and test every theory surrounding the disaster. Including groundbreaking testimony from a young eyewitness, speaking for the first time in 75 years. We saw a little bit of blue fire just forward of the vertical rudder. What we're trying to do is look at the individual elements that can add up to a disaster, and then look what happens when they all come together. After 75 years, can scientists finally answer the question, what destroyed the Hindenburg? Wow! How do you do, everyone? We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg, which was due here in America this morning at dawn, completing the first transatlantic crossing of the 1937 season. The Hindenburg's flight from Germany took three days, 12 hours longer than normal due to bad weather. On board, 97 passengers and crew. Well, here it comes, ladies and gentlemen. And, and 200,000 cubic meters of hydrogen gas. That's a marvelous sight. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship and uh, it's been taken a hold of down on the field by a number of men. It was the Hindenburg's 11th US landing, but the greatest airship in the world was still news. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get this Charlie, get this Charlie. It's crazy and it's crashing. It's crashing terrible. Oh my, get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. The smoke and the flames now and the famous crashing to the ground. All the humanity and all the fans are just screaming around it. 35 passengers and crew died in the inferno. It took 34 seconds and created a 75-year mystery. There was no shortage of theories. Sabotage, an explosion, something like that taking it down. Somebody shooting it from the ground. Maybe a spark from a backfire of an engine. Something related to weather. Some sort of static spark from atmospheric electricity. Air crash investigations were set up in the US and Germany. Both concluded that a spark ignited leaking hydrogen, but couldn't agree on the source of the spark or the hydrogen leak. Many were convinced it had to be sabotage. And other theories have emerged since then. I think it's very important to now look at this with the freshest eyes we possibly can, on the biggest scale we possibly can, and try and pin down what we think happened. Aeronautical engineer Jim Stansfield is leading a team of scientists and engineers to try and solve the mystery. Using a series of 10th scale Hindenburg models. Each model will test a different theory. But which theories are worth testing will be decided in the lab. To be scientific about this, we cannot adopt a pet theory. That's lit. You know, it has to be a level playing field, no emotion, just testing each individually. The Hindenburg that replicates roughly the way it happened on the Hindenburg. Explosives expert Steve Wolf is supervising the model build. Get it flat like that, ready? Contact. 
we're looking at all of the plausible theories, taking those into the lab, and of the ones that are really most likely, those are the ones that we're going to test on our scale models. You see the ventilation shaft in the bottom? It went up through the ship. Supporting the scientists and engineers is airship historian Dan Grossman. It's amazing. It's like the photographs you see of them building it in Germany, and you can sort of imagine yourself being in the ship. The hope is that by recreating each catastrophic scenario and comparing it to the original, they can get close to solving the world's last great air crash mystery. I come from a strong aeronautical background, and planes aren't allowed to fly if nobody knows why the last one crashed. And to a great extent for that reason, it killed off an entire mode of transport. And I think it's important to investigate because a lot of the technical barriers the Germans overcame to get these huge transatlantic airships, I think were a phenomenal achievement and have pretty much gone to the grave because of this one disaster. The first Zeppelin airship took to the skies above Germany in 1900. Before World War I, tens of thousands took the chance to see the world from the air, in genteel comfort. By 1919, the world's first air service was connecting southern Germany with Berlin, in a quarter of the time it took by rail. And by the 30s, Zeppelins were ferrying passengers all over Europe and beyond, almost without competition. Only the Germans seemed able to master the most buoyant but flammable lifting gas, hydrogen. Between 1918 and 1937, five British, French and American airships were destroyed by fire. So many ships filled with hydrogen had burned that no other country even thought about using hydrogen. The rest of the world had abandoned it but Germans had flown hundreds of thousands of miles using hydrogen and had never had a passenger fatality. So they got very confident in their ability to manage this very dangerous gas. Confident enough to build the ultimate hydrogen airship, the Hindenburg. It took five years and 25 million pounds to build. And at 250 meters long, almost as big as the Titanic, it was the largest man-made object ever to fly. Lift came from 16 airtight cotton bags filled with hydrogen gas. The flight deck was housed in an external gondola, while the living quarters were inside the base of the airship, arranged over two decks. Above the kitchen and crew quarters, the main deck held 50 sleeping berths in the center. And either side, spacious passenger lounges offered breathtaking views of the world below. It was the fastest and probably the best passenger airliner in the world in its day. You could cross the Atlantic twice as fast as by ship. It was the Concorde of the 1930s. With a single transatlantic ticket costing as much as a car, it was largely the preserve of the rich, including the first woman to fly around the world, Lady Grace Hay Drummond Hay. I enjoyed the trip tremendously. It was a real revelation. I realized that at last, the commercial uh, airship flying across the Atlantic can uh, mean something. There were some compromises. To avoid fire risk, smoking was restricted to a single pressurized room. To save weight, most of the luggage had to be sent by ship. For the same reason, the lounge bar piano was made of aluminium. But the biggest compromise was political. To build the Hindenburg, the Zeppelin company had to be bankrolled by the Nazi government. Hindenburg began its life, really, as a propaganda ship. In fact, the ship's first real flight in March of 1936 was a propaganda flight, encouraging people to vote yeah 
on the Fuhrer's referendum. As her loudspeakers blare out martial music, she scatters leaflets, urging re-election of the Nazi ticket. They seem to herald the triumphant future Adolf Hitler has promised his people, and the people rush to support it. When you had an opportunity to show the flag, if you had May Day, for example, the 1936 Berlin Olympics, Hindenburg was there. When the Hindenburg flew to New Jersey in May 1937, she was already a familiar sight, flaunting the power of German airship technology and the Nazi flag. Hindenburg was more than just an airship. It had become a very powerful symbol to a regime that cared a lot about powerful symbols. Next morning's first light, a naval inspection board inspects the wreckage, as others search the still smoking ruins for a possible clue that might yield a key to the mysterious disaster. When the Hindenburg burst into flames, for many, the only possible explanation was sabotage. The Nazis were highly unpopular, to say the least, both in the United States and around the world. If you wanted to take a poke at the Nazi regime, downing this huge symbol of Nazi technology and the Nazi flag would have been a great way to do it. There were probably no shortage of people who would have loved to bomb the Hindenburg. In Texas, the team prepares its first Hindenburg model, ready to test the bomb theory. Okay, we need some in the middle here. Yeah. Dave, can you pass me a spray? Jim, here you go. Okay. The theory had more than just motive. There was considerable circumstantial evidence. Just before the disaster, an anonymous letter was passed to the German authorities warning that something would happen to the back of the Hindenburg, exactly where the disaster began. And though news cameras didn't catch the very start, there were eyewitnesses on the ground who did. We were pretty much underneath it. And that's when the fire started. And it didn't start slowly, it started, they, they used the word explosion. And then all of a sudden, the ship tilted a little bit downward. Fire burst forth, so our group turned and ran. And there was one eyewitness whose testimony sheds more light on the disaster than anyone else. Crewman Helmut Lau. The fact that Lau survived is remarkable because he was inside the airship where the disaster began. As he prepared cables for landing, Lau heard what he described as a muffled detonation. It was loud enough to be heard 200 meters away in the Hindenburg's control car. For a fraction of a second, Lau saw fire in the gas bag before it erupted in flame. Was this the result of a bomb? To find out, the investigation team will plant a bomb in their Hindenburg model. In the same place Helmut Lau described the start of the disaster. In his testimony, Lau placed the detonation at the back of the airship, in the center, between two gas bags. Like the Hindenburg, the 10th scale model is essentially a series of gas bags separated by ventilation shafts, enclosed by an aluminium airframe and lightweight skin. It looks like the fire started just about in front of the tail, and so that's where we're gonna place our charge. 
We've got a ventilation shaft that was just like the Hindenburg's. And we think that if we put the charge in there, if it was a charge that set this off, it should look pretty much like the Hindenburg. It heaves that down, and then we'll take in the slack on this side. With construction of the airship almost complete, the team is ready to start filling. With 200 cubic meters of flammable hydrogen gas, it takes three hours before the first Hindenburg model is ready to test. 24 grams of high explosive is planted between two hydrogen bags. I'd take it another 30 degrees. It, it'll kind of almost self-level aerodynamically yes, to some extent. There you go. Yeah, let it go like that. You... That's good. <laughs> Filled with hydrogen, the model now has the same explosive potential as an artillery shell. So will it burn like the Hindenburg or simply blow itself to pieces? Steve and Jem retire to the safety of the camera truck to watch. Clear the site. Three, two, one, zero. In Texas, the investigation team plant a bomb in their test model. Okay, Nick, that's charged. Okay, we're going up. Okay. Up. okay. In 1937, sabotage was considered a serious possibility. Three, two, one, zero. Go. Go. Look at her go. Oh. Uh. That's not far Ooh. off the real thing. She sure isn't. She's fire started right here, moved along. It just sort of fits because given and, the differences and, and, in volume, wow. I think it's pretty much doing what it should do. Yeah. The explosive detonation matches the start of the Hindenburg fire, which progresses as the ship falls, leaving an equivalent portion still burning as it hits the ground. You can still feel the heat in here. Yeah. You that was a hell of a simulation. The bomb theory looks technically convincing. And in 1937, many looked no further for an explanation. There were a lot of people who would have liked this to be sabotage. Because if it's sabotage, then this airship project that they've worked on for their whole careers is suddenly more credible. It's not the ship that failed. It was a terrorist. New York City. One passenger came under suspicion. A German-American acrobat named Josef Spa. That's what you'd call a suspended sentence. Spa had demanded access to the back of the ship to feed his dog. And he had the acrobatic skills to climb the rigging and plant a bomb. To the investigators, he seemed the perfect saboteur. Yet Family Man Spa had no record or motive. And though the FBI investigated for two months, they gave up, having found absolutely nothing. Dan Grossman believes they should have given up long before then, because there is evidence in the flight records which a bomb simply cannot explain. For several minutes before it blew up, the back of the Hindenburg was dropping. 
For Dan, it points to an obvious culprit, leaking hydrogen. While the ship is in its final approach landing pattern at Lakehurst, they realize that the ship is tail heavy. The ship is supposed to land in trim. It's not supposed to land nose up or nose down. To level the ship, the crew followed standard procedure. They release hydrogen gas from the front so that the front will be heavier. They release water ballast from the tail so that the tail will be lighter. It doesn't work. In desperation, they ordered six men to the front of the ship to try and weigh the nose down. But even that didn't work. The officers in the control car know something's wrong. This is not normal. They're losing hydrogen. They had to suspect a leak. And I've always wondered whether some of those guys just knew this wasn't going to end well. No one has ever found the cause of the leak. One theory is that the ship was overstressed in its final turn and a bracing wire snapped, slashing open a gas bag. The other possibility was that a gas valve stuck open. It had happened before. Whatever the cause, an estimated 1,500 cubic meters of hydrogen leaked from the back of the ship and escaped through the ventilation shafts. Open at the top and bottom, these were designed to remove any free hydrogen by allowing air to flow through the ship. But inside the shaft, the hydrogen and air would mix. It was this mix, Jem Stansfield believes, that could have destroyed the Hindenburg. He sets out to replicate what might have happened. Hydrogen's one of the most explosive gases known to man. 10 litres of hydrogen contains as much explosive power as maybe like 25 grams an ounce of TNT. To a bag of pure hydrogen, Jem adds 10% air, and with it, the critical ingredient, oxygen. Three, two, one. <laughs> this seems to match the explosive fire seen by eyewitnesses. Was it also the detonation heard by Helmut Lau? Good start, Billing. Jem doesn't think so. He adds 20% more air. Three, two, one. The result is even more explosive. I think on the Hindenburg, there's a combination of what we've seen there. I think that there's probably a pocket in the Hindenburg where it had built up a more explosive ratio, less hydrogen, more air. Ooh. That crack is probably the shudder that people felt. Then what's happened is that's released much more hydrogen from the bags, and then that's burning, and you start getting that rich orange flame. The Hindenburg was tail heavy for at least eight minutes. Building up inside an explosive cocktail of hydrogen and air. All it needed was a spark. Above the airship hung the biggest generator of electric sparks on Earth, a thunderstorm. In a storm, a vast electric potential builds up between the Earth and the sky, which can be released as lightning. An airship in this environment isn't affected by lightning because it's not earthed. However, the giant airship will generate a huge electric potential of its own. When the Hindenburg came into land, it dropped its landing lines onto the rain-soaked earth. So we waited and waited, and while we were waiting, 
It rained, and I mean a downpour. The ropes had just been dropped, and each man grabbed one. And then it just burst into flame. It engulfed us completely. The German investigators believed a static spark inside the airship destroyed the Hindenburg. The team set out to test the German theory. Right, swing one here. The Germans believed that there could have been a static spark somewhere between the skin and the metal frame. But what it is about the skin that could have produced that spark relative to the frame is something that I think needs investigation. They recreate a full-scale section of painted cotton skin and aluminium airframe. We've got six to ten millimetres gap here. Yeah. Um, and then we've got... With the same contact points and a gap where the Germans thought the spark occurred. OK, let's get a bit of rain. They recreate the storm with plenty of water. Wow. Which I think we're pretty much there. And get ready to charge up their model. As the Hindenburg came into land, she had a huge electric potential relative to the Earth. When the landing ropes hit the wet ground, the airframe became earthed, as did the skin, where it touched the frame. But the skin was a poor conductor and waterproof. So the water wasn't earthed and kept its electric potential. Sounds good. All right, hot wire the team way. recreate the same situation. We've got it right in a water puddle. With an electric terminal in the water and the frame earthed. Then they turn on the power. Clear, yeah. clear. Coming up to 10,000. Wow, right away. Look at that. With this waterproof layer on it, you would have electrically isolated areas that couldn't leak their charge back to the frame, and that can build up a big voltage difference between it and the frame, and then click. That's released as a spark. So now that we know that we have a spark, we know that we have hydrogen oxygen, it's entirely likely that we would have a fire burning there. The team get ready to test the theory on the next 10th scale Hindenburg model. Come right at the middle between the ribs and go ahead and put those wraps in. As soon as the skin is on, the hydrogen is delivered and the gas bags inflated. Just let it rise up. Okay. Engineers wire an igniter high up under the roof. The German investigators claimed a fire began here and spread forward, producing an explosion in the hydrogen bags that brought down the Hindenburg. Move on a little bit more. But this official explanation has never been tested. Until now. The anchor's there. Yeah. You can feel the heat oh, instantly. You can feel, you can feel wow. it. Oh, wow. oh my god. Oh my god, look at that. Oh wow. Ballonet is still too ballonet. But despite the excitement of being close to the burning model. The other one though, the other one looked much more like it. More. Yeah, it did. It did. The result is disappointing. This is what is generally regarded as the most likely mechanism of failure, yet it didn't look similar to the Hindenburg. 
The fire opened the top of the ship quickly and the hydrogen burned fast. But there was no sense of explosion as there clearly was in the Hindenburg and in the previous test. For my money, this sabotage shot looked much more like the Hindenburg. That sudden release from the huge ruptures in the bag, that a tremendous amount of hydrogen all at once, and that mushroom coming up, I think is closer to what I saw in the archival footage. An explosively initiated fire seems to produce a more Hindenburg-like result. And then it begs the question, so what caused the explosion? With the static spark theory failing to produce an explosion and no evidence of a bomber, the team is running out of options. That was actually my preferred mechanism uh -huh. for, for disaster. And that's kind of the conventional. But there is one recent controversial theory that could provide an answer. An ex-NASA scientist claimed it wasn't the hydrogen that was ignited by the spark. It was the airship's skin. Without realizing it, the Germans had painted the Hindenburg with the ingredients of rocket fuel. Recent and controversial theory. That's a holder. Yeah, that's pretty good. That the Hindenburg was destroyed by the paint in its skin. There's a layer of aluminium that was put in the top surface of the paint to reflect the sun's rays. And then there was a layer of iron oxide that was put into the bottom surface of the paint. According to the theory, if the skin is ignited, these chemicals produce an ingredient of rocket fuel called thermite. When you see a thermite reaction take off, you, you, know, you, you know something's happening. You're backing away from it straight away. It's, it's thousands of degrees. The speed and intensity of the Hindenburg fire suggest an explosive reaction. If the incendiary paint theory is correct, it could solve the mystery of the Hindenburg once and for all. The test is a simple comparison of two pieces of cotton aircraft skin. The unpainted piece on the right will burn, but the piece on the left, painted like the Hindenburg, should burn like a blowtorch. Three, two, one, gas. They burn pretty much the same and there's practically no difference in timing. There is no apparent thermite reaction whatsoever. There's, there's no kind of end result that would suggest any kind of reaction like that happened. That just didn't occur. There's, it simply didn't. The last Hindenburg test model is being built. All right, all hands on deck over here. But the team needs a theory to test. Keep rolling it. That's there great. Go. Got it. Okay. So far, the bomb theory looks the most convincing. But it cannot identify a bomber or explain leaking hydrogen. The theory that a static spark ignited that hydrogen worked in the lab, but failed to deliver an explosive result in the real world. and the incendiary paint theory produced no result at all. But there is recently discovered evidence which offers hope of a new theory. Based on eyewitness testimony that has been overlooked for 75 years. On May the 6th, 1937, eight-year-old Mark Heald was taken by his father to watch the Hindenburg land. But they were far away from the crowds. Years later, my father realized that he should have volunteered uh, testimony in some of the 
uh, initial investigations because we were probably in a rather unusual location. As I recall, we were seeing it from pretty much a side view. Everyone else was underneath, unable to see what Mark and his dad saw on the top of the Hindenburg, just moments before it burst into flames. We saw a little bit of, of blue fire just forward of the uh, vertical rudder, the upper rudder. It hung right to the top ridge. And my father said, oh my goodness, the thing's aflame. Park him there for the time being. If the mysterious blue flame led to the disaster, what was it? For Jem, there's one intriguing possibility. A rare phenomenon seen for centuries, where tall objects in storms seem to produce mysterious flashes, known as St. Elmo's fire. You get something that's connected to the ground, but the top of it is in a, in a very different electrical situation up there, higher in the atmosphere the air gets broken down by the difference in kind of electrical charge there, and, and you get like a kind of coronal discharge. And when the Hindenburg was flying into land, the tail of the ship is maybe 60 or 100 meters above the ground, yet electrically connected to the ground. That is where you could get like a St. Elmo's fire. All right, let's hook her up. Yep. Just like the Hindenburg, the model is connected to the ground. Yeah, that's nice. Above, a simulated storm cloud in the form of a massive electric charge. All right, coming up, we're at 10,000. 20, 30, 40. Hang on, I might be able to see something. Let me get a camera and just see if I can get something. Black behind. Uh, please, thank you. Something seems to be happening, but it's very faint. When they dim the lights, Oh, wow, look at that, Jim. Look, 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 look. Oh, I think we've got six there. of them there. So there's a lot of heat there. The model gives off flickering blue flames of a coronal discharge. St. Elmo's fire. In 1937, US investigators did speculate this might have been a source of ignition and the Germans thought it theoretically possible, but unlikely. There was simply never any evidence. Until now. It's very similar to, in mechanism to the discharge that was actually witnessed. But it poses a problem. If there was St. Elmo's fire on the outside of the ship, how did it produce this? Steve Wolf notices something about his position. We're getting the sparking along this edge. You have to remember there was a vent right here and a vent right there. Yeah. If the Hindenburg was leaking hydrogen through its air vents, the flammable gas could hit the St. Elmo's fire on the fin. You can imagine on a bigger scale, if there was a flammable hydrogen air mix moving up over that, there is every chance you would get ignition there. Absolutely. Could the same air vents somehow bring a fire inside the ship? And if you'll help me just... In the lab, they connect a smoke machine to a plastic tube, open at both ends. Here we go. A model of the Hindenburg ventilation system. Centered. Spot. Beautiful. Holes in the bottom of the airship allowed air to rise between the gas bags to flush away any leaking hydrogen. But it created a highly flammable mix inside the tube. This is where Helmut Lau heard a detonation and saw gas bags erupt in flames. Was the ventilation system the Hindenburg's Achilles heel? They release hydrogen into their tube. That's lit. And ignite it. So there's a fire outside the ship. Yup. An infrared camera shows the hydrogen fire 
staying outside. That's not wanting to do anything. Are you as high as you can go? But then... Whoa! There we go! Look at it go! Oh. Oh. Can it draw back in the beast? Yeah, I can. Went all the way right here, two meters down, popped right to the source and lit. So this shows really conclusively that if you have an ignition outside and you have the right hydrogen oxygen blend coming up to it, it'll light out there and zap right back into the center of the ship. Whoa! Wow. They seem to have found the key to the disaster. If St. Elmo's fire was the source of ignition, what made that spark so deadly was the ventilation shaft. Whoa! There we go! I reacted to that as if it was an explosion. That, to me, fits with Helmut Lau's description of the events. And also, if you imagine the size of the vent tubes in, in the Hindenburg, if you'd have had a fire rapidly tracking down there, it would have been an awful lot louder, and the percussive shock would have been bigger, and no doubt the fire at the bottom would have been bigger too. The team built their last 10th scale Hindenburg model. OK, so we want to start pulling them down and tacking the very bottom spot with one last theory to test. A fire started where you see that vent shaft opening. And that, that fire got sucked down this ventilation shaft and then ignited the hydrogen right here where we are in the center of the ship. That would account for what Helmut Lau said he saw, which was a gigantic combustion of hydrogen in the middle of the ship. When he looked up, he saw what he thought was either a flame or an explosion. We were able to locate where that point was on the ship. And a fire started in the center would have a much more dramatic effect than a fire starting at the top. Having done the lab tests and testing out the ability to track down a pipe, the hydrogen loves that scene. And I, uh, I can see this working quite like the real thing. The team is sold on the ventilation theory. Will the final test prove them right? One Hindenburg model remains. I want her off as high as she can go yep. this time. Let her go up. One last chance to find an answer. Are you guys all the way up yet? Yes. Okay. Their theory is that an explosive fire in the ventilation system caused the disaster. Three, two, one, zero. Yep, there's the flame. Holy oh, look! There it is. Wow! <laughs> oh, she's the baby, huh? Look at that. Look at that. That's wow, gone in oh a very my gosh, way. look at that. It has. Still another balance. There it goes. Pop. Oh, wow. The team's first reaction is positive. Coming way, oh my goodness. Wow, that's a lot more dramatic. This time round, it's like, has it, has that gone? And then suddenly there's like a leap of flame from the back. The very beginning looked very much like when you see that flame in front of that horizontal uh, stabilizer. That, that tail fin, and then the rest of it took off. So that looked a lot like the actual films. We've gone past it. Well, maybe not. Maybe you're right, actually. Is it close enough to convince the team? So let's make this one a they little They compare smaller. their test footage to the original. Let's see where is our... And that's... It is roughly comparable there at the same stage. Yeah fire in here would ex explain that just huge bursting into flame all at yeah. once, which is sort of what we see in the actual yeah. crash yeah. footage. And it's similar to what we see in, in that crash yeah. footage there. The explosive start in the center at the back of the ship matches the Hindenburg. The way the fire progresses matches the Hindenburg. 
The way most of the airship is still intact as it hits the ground matches the Hindenburg. So, do they agree on what destroyed the Hindenburg? Now, I think the most likely mechanism for providing the spark is electrostatic. That starts at the top, OK? Then the flames from our experiments would have probably tracked down to the, to the centre with an explosive mixture of gas that gave them woof when it got to the bottom. Then the fire went up. The woof was consistent with that. The rapid spread of destruction was consistent with that. I think that's exactly what happened. I think you had massive distribution of hydrogen throughout the aft half of the ship. You had an ignition source pull down into the ship, and that whole back portion of the ship went up almost at once. The investigation can now offer a solution to the 75-year mystery. As the Hindenburg approached Lakehurst, she became charged up in a massive electric storm. Making her final turn to land, a broken wire or a sticking gas valve leaked hydrogen into the ventilation shafts. Outside, as the rain fell, ground crew grabbed the landing ropes, earthing the airship. Coming up. Mark Heald watched St. Elmo's fire appear on the tail. Leaking hydrogen hit the flames. A fire tracked to the source of the leak, triggering a detonation. And the end of the Hindenburg had begun. Few disasters have left such an impression on the world or had such an impact on a single industry. The end of the Hindenburg meant the end of the age of the airship. At least now, the world knows why. Thank you.